Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome back to another edition of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm about 17 rum and cokes down. Sandogi's had to run back from the drink from the bar to record an emergency podcast after the West Indies. The West Indies have released the Test Squad to Australia late on a Friday night. We've had to run home to record this one. Listen, Santoki, I'm waved out here, but we got to do the reaction all the same. Listen, How you doing, Santoki? Yeah, tis, tis the season to be jolly mash, but not if you're a West Indies fan. I was at the bar. I saw that squad. I took another shot. I messaged Mash. I said, Mash, <laughs> we got to run home, you know. It's cool. So we got we to hit the bat signal on this one. We got to run home. Emergency podcast, because even by West Indian standards, this is a madness of a squad which we have seen selected to tour. Big Australia, no. <laughs> Big Australia, the legacy, the Frank Wall legacy, the history in Australia, and we've named we've named the squad with seven of the fifteen. So the headline is seven of the fifteen man squad are uncapped and never played a test before. We're moving like it's COVID emergency times out here. There's no COVID. We just named this squad for no reason. <laughs> so mash. <laughs> There's no rules oh, yeah. on this show, yeah, because oh, we're both waved oh, out here. But yeah, Mash, that... do you want to kick us off and just like name the squad, and then we'll just try and try and dissect whatever comes to mind? The people are saying in the chat that I said Friday night in the intro. That's how you know I'm waved out here. <laughs> uh, listen... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, listen, it's Wednesday night, people. The thing is, the school term has just ended, and I was out celebrating and enjoying myself, <laughs> thinking, yes, two and a half weeks off. And now the West Indies selectors have broke up my vibes. I've had to come home. I've had to come home and record emergency podcast and, and end all celebrations. But let me just um first things first, let me read, let me read the West Indies. Uh let me read the press release. So it says the following. The Cricket West Indies senior men's selection panel today announced a 15-member squad to travel to Australia to play a two-test series as part of the World Test Championship from the 17th to the 29th of January 2024. West Indies will be led by captain Craig Brathwaite with fast bowler Alzari Joseph as the new vice-captain. The squad will arrive in Australia on the 30th of December and will hold a preparation camp from the 2nd to the 9th of January in Adelaide, followed by a four-day first-class warm-up match against a Cricket Australia eleven in Adelaide from the 10th to the 13th of Jan. The selectors have named several uncapped players in the squad. These are batter Zachary McCaskey, wicketkeeper Tevin Imlach, all-rounders Justin Graves, Kavem Hodge, Kevin Sinclair, as well as fast bowlers Akeem Jordan and Shamar Joseph. Speaking about the makeup of the squad, Cricket West, Cricket West Indies lead selector, the most honourable Dr Desmond Haynes said, the squad has been affected by the unavailability of some key players. However, we have had a very strong Red Bull programme being run over the past year, which has unearthed significant talent throughout the region. The selected players have passed each test given to them and must now be given the opportunity to showcase their skills in the test arena. Australia away is always a challenge, but we are confident in our team. And the squad selected is as follows, Santoki. Craig Brathwaite, captain. Alzari Joseph, vice-captain. Tej Narayan Shandapal, Kurt McKenzie, Alec Athanes, Kavem Hodge, Justin Graves, Josh De Silva, Akeem Jordan, Gudakesh Moti, Kamar Roach, Kevin Sinclair, Tevin Imlak, Shamar Joseph, Zachary McCaskey. The additional notes that were given, Jaden Seals is unavailable due to a shoulder injury picked up in South Africa. And Jason Holder and Carl Mayers are unavailable as they have expressed a preference to explore T20 franchise opportunities in January. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't even know, Santoki, where to start with this one. Should we, should we start with Holder and Mayers? Because I think that was to be expected, to be fair. Yeah, and um, just literally in the last 10 minutes, Jason Holder's given an interview where he essentially explained that Cricket West Indies said, 
players need to play that T20 leg in Australia if they want to be considered for the 2024 Home World Cup. So Jason Holder, as a result, he said he had to give up a big bash deal and he's had to cut part of his UAE T20 deal, some of it, to fly out to Australia to play in that leg. So he's essentially saying he wants to make the most of playing T20 cricket in January to make up for what he's kind of lost by having to play this uh, the bilaterals in Australia and then focus on T20 cricket until that World Cup and then after the World Cup, return to Test cricket. So, Mash, sort of where do you, where do you stand on that? Do you think that's... Uh, now he's sort of rationalised it. From his point of view, I don't. I can see why he's sort of done this because essentially he's he's 32 years old. He needs to maximise as many bags as he can. He didn't get an IPL deal. If Cricket West Indies have said, obviously you have to play T20s to get in in Australia to get into the World Cup squad. He's essentially said, okay, if I'm going to have to do that, then I'm not going to play the tests because my priority at the moment is you know T20 sort of franchise cricket. Where do you sort of stand on that, or do you think someone of Holder's talent? and ability that we know should have been going on that test tour to Australia. So the, the way I start this conversation is to say the following. This is Australia away. And, and, and let's be realistic about this, right? When it comes to the sternest tests in test cricket, if test cricket is still the pinnacle, if test cricket is still what every cricketer claims is the best version of the game, right? Unless they're all chatting shit, right? Australia away, India away, England away, and all those three teams at home are the biggest games you can play in Test cricket. If Jason Holder is turning around to Cricket West Indies and the selectors and saying, I don't want to play a Test a test series against Australia because I want to maximise my bag. Why play against... Don't come to England then in the summer. Mm-hmm. Like, do, do, do you know what I mean? Like, Because yeah. let's be consistent. The same way how everybody wanted to run Chris Gale and Kyron Pollard and uh, Sunil Narine and Dwayne Bravo, they wanted to run all their men against the uh, across the coal and say, you lot are mercenaries and so on and so forth. Let's be consistent then. You can't pick and choose which test series you do and don't want to play in. If you, do, if you don't think that playing away against Australia is important enough, and then, but you do think going to England is important enough, like... Is it one rule for Jason Holder and another rule for everybody else? And I'm not I'm not anti Jason Holder, but let's keep it a buck. Let's keep it, let's keep it, let's keep it 100. Let's let's be consistent. Is Jason Holder allowed to pick and choose when he does and doesn't play for the West Indies? Because whether he means it to come across like that or not, that's effectively what he's saying. I'm not going Australia to play test cricket, but I will turn up to England to play test cricket. My thing is this. West Indies selectors should say, you know what, Jason Holder, thank you for your service for 11 years. We just won't pick you again. Like, go go earn your bag. Go do your thing. But you can't pick and... In the same way how Hetmeyer can't pick and choose, no one else should be allowed to pick and choose. Or, yeah. or am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong for saying that. No, I think you're right. I think you can't, you can't essentially say, listen, I'm going to maximise my earnings, which is fair enough. I think we all understand that. Players want to maximise their earnings. But at the same time, you can't say... I'm going to return to Test cricket after the World Cup because then it's a disrespect to the men who are going to tour Australia and taking these licks or whatever they're going to take in Australia. And then what one's going to get dropped because Jason Holder decides he wants to play Test cricket again. It's kind of, it's double standards. And when you factor in the fact that he's chosen to skip ODIs as well for the same reason, it's kind of like, how far do you take it then? Uh, you're just having a man select what type of what type of format he's going to play and when he's going to play it. So I agree. I think, there needs to be a clearer line in place, clearer boundaries in place as to what and what you can do. I get there needs to be some sort of flexibility in terms of selection, but I just feel at the moment with Holder, if he's not playing ODIs and he's not playing tests and he's essentially, he's basically just playing T20s of us, that's fair enough, but then just retire from the other formats. Like, don't well, don't 100%. say like, don't say like, oh, I'm going to come back after the World Cup because then that's just, it's almost like a, it's like a weird arrogance, complacency kind of thing. Like, yeah, I'm going to make the test squad again. Whereas, Everyone else, you know, they're, they're, they're playing test cricket in Australia. They'll have to, a lot of players have had to earn their right to get into the test side. So I don't think you can just walk in it. And so it's a weird one. It's kind of like, it's, it's a grey area at the moment with Jason Holder. But you never know, with West Indies cricket, we never know what's going to happen throughout the year. He may well very retire from test and ODI by this time next year. So we don't know what's going to happen. But at the moment, I just feel like 
like you said, it, it, considering what the public and what the media did to Gail and the quote unquote mercenaries as well, this is sort of like this is along the same uh, along the same lines, but no one's really no one will say anything because it is Jason Holder essentially. But yeah, it's it's a messy one. Um, with Carl Mayers, I don't think I think we were expecting him to not get picked anyway based on um merit. So it's not as big a blow. But again, Carl Mayers is one to secure the bag. He's 31, 32 years old, so he's out here to secure the bag. But with them select, with them um, not picking the central contracts, not signing the central contracts, it sort of foreshadowed this situation happening. Um, I think with Cricket West Indies, they'll sort of allow this to, flexibility to happen because essentially they want their best players at the World Cup, the home World Cup. After the World Cup, we might see them come down a bit more and oh, you can't pick and choose sort of what you want to what you want to play. We've seen it in um, New Zealand. They've said Trent Bolt, um, he's turned down a central contract, but they've the New Zealand Cricket Board. Now the World Cup's done, they've essentially said, we're going to give priority to the guys who did sign the contract, who, who are going on every single tour. So I think maybe after the Home World Cup's done, we might see a firmer line from Cricket West Indies. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And um, yeah, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there. So, I mean, swiftly moving on, because we don't want this to be a long, this could easily be a long episode. But if this goes longer and longer, I'm going to start slurring my words. <laughs> <laughs> so let's try and keep it free. Um, Jermaine Blackwood. So uh, when the central contracts were announced about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, we both noticed that Jermaine Blackwood wasn't included in that. Our synopsis of that was, well, he's going to get dropped then. Because if he doesn't have a central contract, he was he played every single test match last year. He was a test match vice captain. If they haven't given him a central contract, then he must be getting dropped. As expected, he was not included in the in the squad to tour Australia. Desmond Haynes, I just I just came out of the press conference about half an hour ago. Desmond Haynes was asked about Jermaine Blackwood Santoki, and two things came to light. Uh, it was Jerome Foster um, in Jamaica who asked um, Desmond Haynes about uh, Jermaine Blackwood, and two things came up. Uh, Jerome said to him, "Does Jermaine know that he's been dropped, or has he found out via this press release?" And Des said he owes Jermaine Blackwood a phone call. So we are to take from that that no one has actually phoned Jermaine Blackwood to say, we are dropping you and this is why we're dropping you. So when we found out the squad, evidently that's when Jermaine Blackwood found out the squad as well, right? And the second thing we're to take from that is that uh, Des said that Jermaine needs to go back to four-day cricket, make some runs. And he also mentioned in Kruma Bonner's name, I said, I want to see them go back to four-day cricket and make some runs. Where do you stand on all of that with Jermaine Blackwood, Santoki? Well, firstly, I think... I don't know how Desmond Haynes gets away with owing players' phone calls. He said the same about Rotherham Howard. He sort of said the same thing about Sunil and Ryan. I don't get it because as a lead selector, you're meant to communicate with players. So, especially Jermaine Blackwood. So, you're telling me your vice captain, who's been in the test side, played every test match last year, is finding out basically via a press release that he's not made the squad. That shows that there's no respect for that for that player then, a senior player in the squad. It just seems weird that there's, there's a lack of communication between... I mean, we've said this in numerous shows before. There obviously is some issue in the line of communication between Haynes and a lot of the players because it takes two minutes to phone up a player and have a quick conversation and explain things. So if you're saying you're owing Rothman Powell, another senior player, you're owing Jermaine Blackwood a phone call, what are you doing with your time? It needs to be asked, basically. So I think that's the first thing. Blackwood, I mean, there, there are there, if there were quality replacements lining up, I think there would be a justification for him to not make the squad. I don't think he did a. I don't think he put his. He, he excelled in 2023 enough for him to say he's guaranteed a place. But if you're looking at that squad, if you're looking at a McCaskey and a Justin Greaves who got picked, you're essentially saying based on their performances. I mean, Justin Greaves averaged 25 in the regional season. <laughs> in the regional season, he averaged 25. And I think he batted at, what, six in the for Team Headley in the Headley Weeks thing, and he scored four and 25, and that was his last first-class game. So Justin Greaves, obviously, he had an excellent Super 50. Are they just hoping that he's in form in 50-over cricket so that he can just transfer it over to four-day cricket? But at the same time, are you also saying he would be, or him or even a McCaskey would be an improvement on Blackwood in Australia? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's a weird one. If we, I mean, I'll, I'll leave McCaskey out for a minute because McCaskey is likely an opener, right? A replacement yeah. for uh, Craig or Tej. But if we look at Kevem Hodge and we look at Justin Graves, who are yeah. effectively, when you look at the squad, they must be the middle order replacements for Jermaine Blackwood because there's no one else, right? Because the top five is essentially rights itself, Santolki, uh, or top four even. Craig, yeah. Tej, 
Kirk, McKenzie, Alec Athanes, and then one of Kevem Hodge, or possibly both, Kevem Hodge and Justin Graves, are going to have to bat five and six or four and six, or maybe even Kevin Sinclair will have to bat six. I don't even know what that batting lineup will look like, right? But let's just take those two uh, squad replacements, um, Kevin Hodge and Justin Graves. Justin Graves, and I asked Des about this. So when it came round, when it came time for me to ask Des a question, I said, Des, how, on, how did Justin Graves get in the test match squad? He ain't, his Red Bulls cricket is nothing to write home about. I said it to Des straight. I said, he's got no Red Bull numbers to justify a test call. So I said, Des, have you called him up based on what he did in Super 50? And Des's response was, Justin has played well in 18 cricket. I'll admit that when he said that, I was like, 18? It didn't, I didn't immediately think of any 18 numbers that Justin Graves has got that I need. I need to go back and look. Maybe he's got some a recent 18 cricket that I need to go and look at to remind myself. He says he's played well in 18 cricket and he's a good all-rounder. So they see Justin Graves likely as the like-for-like replacement for Jason Holder. Okay, that's a big stretch, but okay, right? Kevem Hodge just went to South Africa and averaged 30 in that three-match on that uh, three-match unofficial test series, right? I like Kevem Hodge. I think he's a gritty player. I think he works very hard. But are we basically saying that having dropped Jermaine Blackwood and not called one of Casey Carty? Brandon King, Shea Hope, Darren Bravo, that this is the next player we can turn to. We ain't got no one else to try find. This is the next player we've got to turn to. And that's, again, no no criticism of Kevem Hodge. It's more, to me, Santoki, a criticism of how shallow our pool is that the next best options we had were Justin Graves and Kevem Hodge. I, I think that says an awful lot about what we don't have. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just looking through. I don't even think... When did Justin Greaves even play on um, 18 cricket? I don't I'm sure know, because when, when, when Des said it, my head got hot because I was like, what? I, like, I was trying to picture in my head, what 18 cricket? Have I missed something in my head? So my thing is, I think Justin Graves has been called purely off the back of Super 50, which again, Santoki, goes back to my point. I've had to listen to people say to us on this channel for the last two years... Nicholas Puran can't play for West Indies test team because he doesn't have enough four-day cricket behind him. I've just seen Justin Graves get called into the West Indies test team. Justin Graves just got called into West Indies test team off the back of Super 50. Any, as far as I'm concerned, anyone can get called up to West Indies now. Anyone can. If you can get but, called up to the back of Super 50, anyone can, cuz. But I don't understand because... What was I going to... Because just, Justin Graves, even, he's been injured as well. So he hasn't done any prep in between the end of Super 50 and now. So we're just throwing man into Australia without he last played a Red Bull game the Headley Weeks in May. He didn't play in the A team tours against Bangladesh. So what is he averaged twenty five in the five game season, domestic season. So the numbers just don't add up. Surely there were other. I'm I'll have to go through the stats as well. Surely you could have found a batsman performing better. But I will say this match. Obviously you were at the press conference and you you tweeted out the notes. Obviously when Darren Bravo was approached. Desmond Haynes confirmed. He said he's still taking a break from cricket. Darren Barbo said, listen, I'm I'm not ready for... <laughs> I'm not coming back for you guys. Um, Shea Hope said he wants to explore T20 opportunities. Obviously, he got that IPL bag let me, Santoki, let me yeah. come in there because that's an interesting one with Shea. So, again, when I, when I spoke to Des, I asked Des specifically because originally someone else asked about Shea Hope and Des's original response to that was Shea is unavailable for selection. So when it came round for me to ask Des, I said, but what is Shea unavailable for? Is he pursuing T20 contracts or has Shea explicitly said that he's not ready to come back to test cricket? And Des's response was, I'll, I'll go back and listen to the recording, but Des's response was, the best way to answer this, Michelle, is that Shea says he's unavailable. So we will see, because come that Australia tour, if we suddenly see Shea Hope in, what's the league that's happening in January? Is it that international IL, cricket one? Yeah, IL. So if we suddenly see announced in the next two weeks that Shea's got a big bag in that international league, well, that tells you what it is, that even Shea Hope has said, you know what, it's T20 bag time. I don't even want to return to test cricket. Mm, exactly. So... I mean the other so the other player who um I guess we kind of thought he might get called up um 
because he has played on the 18 tour, Tevin Imlac. But with Imlac, I don't even, it's, it's a weird set of circumstances with him because on, st- on statistics, you'd be like, why is Imlac in the squad? But when you think about it, obviously, he's come as a second, as a backup wicketkeeper. Um, Shane Dowich retired. If Shane Dowich didn't retire, Shane, Af- these averages are pretty solid. But I'm sure he averaged 25 in the season, last most recent season. But I need to check his overall his overall average. Let me see, man, what it is. His overall average, just Justin Gray's average is 20, 27 oh in first-class cricket <laughs> with the bat. <laughs> and tw- in fairness, 20, 23 with the ball. So yeah. remember, in fairness to Dez, Dez has said that Justin Graves is there to replace Jason Holder. So I don't yeah. know... I don't know how this is going to look like in a team lineup. But anyway, continue your point about Imlac. Yeah, so Imlac, obviously, he's the backup wicketkeeper for Josh De Silva. Dalwich retired. We thought Dalwich would get a call up for the test side. Devon Thomas, obviously, got a ban. Um, Shea Hope said he's unavailable. So it's sort of just all everyone else has sort of fallen around. So Imlac is essentially the next best available wicketkeeper in the region. So with Imlac, I don't really have, have a problem, Mash. Yeah, like I'm not expecting unless there was a, a serious injury to Josh De Silva, it just yeah. is what it is. Has Tevin Imlac done enough to be in a West Indies Test match squad? No. But is there anybody else to call? No. So again, it's just a sign of, of kind of where we're at. Um so I mean that kind of glosses over the the batters that have been called up. Obviously, we could talk about Zachary McCaskey, but I think mm. his call up was probably a certainty. Based on what he'd done on the A tour, they would always need a backup um, opener. So it makes sense that Zachary McCaskey would go. He went to South Africa. It makes sense that you'd carry him to Australia. If we look at the bowlers, Santoki. So for that India series, um, we had uh, Shannon Gabriel, uh, Jamel Warrican, uh, who am I missing? Rakeem Cornell bowled in oh, that yeah, first Jimbo. test and then got the chest infection. They're all out. So the new bowlers that have come in, Gudakesh Multi comes back, which is obviously to be expected, but the names really to talk about. Akeem Jordan's in, which is interesting given that I'm not expecting it to swing a lot in Australia, so he yeah. may not play. But the two names to talk about in terms of bowlers are Shamar Joseph and Kevin Sinclair. Sinclair's easier. I think everyone expected Sinclair to get a call up, so that's no shock whatsoever. But um, talk to me, Santoki, about... Shamar Joseph, Shamar Joseph, Joseph's rise. Sorry, he's gone from security guard to West Indies potential <laughs> debut in Australia in one year. Yeah, is it? I mean, he bowls quick. He's one of the quickest bowlers in the region outside of Alzari and Shannon Gabriel. Is it just a sign of where we're at that we have yeah. no other option? We just have to turn to man, even with his limited um, experience. Yeah, I think I think first up, we have to respect Shamar Joseph. Obviously, what a rise from from us. And the thing with Shamar Joseph is obviously it's been covered. He was a security guard, full time security guard this year. Got a guy in a Harpy Eagles contract. He's worked his way up through there. But the other mad thing is that he never came through any youth teams in Guyana or anything like that. He started out playing uh, second division cricket in Burbies, like club cricket locally, as an adult, and then has just worked his way up now to the point of twenty four. Where he's made it so again it's even more remarkable that not only if you if you take the story from becoming the security guard just the fact he was never in the system he sort of essentially just come out of nowhere but i think mash this goes back to a sort of philosophy in cricket that like with batting it's a skill that you need experience to develop whereas with bowling it's always seen as you're born with that natural talent so the experience doesn't matter as much so i think they've gone with that with shamar joseph they haven't got a stock of bowlers he's a pace bowler who's in form so they're picking him. He's only played five first-class games, though. So, again, the question is, it's, it's two-folded. One, is he just going to struggle in Australia because he just hasn't got that top-level experience? Or two, because he's such an unknown quantity, could he be effective in Australia? There won't be much footage of him bowling. No one will really have much data on him. Um, He's got really nothing to lose. So it'd be interesting. It's an interesting pick. But, again, it goes back to your fundamental question, Mash. It's just a sign of where we are. Under no circumstances, as a test-playing nation... You know, one of the one of the ten teams that played Test cricket, we shouldn't be relying on a fast bowler who's played five first class games to come and save us in Australia. We should have enough depth to sort of cover that. But essentially, I'm surprised also they went with Alzari Joseph as vice captain purely just because I think he's going to have a lot on his shoulders as essentially the senior pacer 
carrying this, this, this attack in Australia. And then obviously the addition of our vice captain. I thought personally they would have gone with Josh De Silva, who's the 18 captain. But I, I noticed you tweeted that Desmond Haynes said De Silva, he doesn't feel he's ready for that role yet. So it's interesting. I just feel there's going to be a massive, massive burden on Alzari Joseph on this tour. Yeah, I, I was surprised at that one. Obviously, Alzari is the vice captain now for... What did he get for? Oh, ODIs. Was it ODIs? Yeah. I think he was vice captain for ODIs. Obviously, Alzari led the, the Leeward Islands successfully in Super 50, uh, took them to the, the finals where they lost to Trinidad and Tobago. So Alzari was a youth team captain um, in Antigua. So they obviously have identified Alzari as having a clear head on, um, kind of like a balanced head on his shoulder, so to speak. Interesting that they've gone down the route um, of making him test vice captain. I mean, it's probably guaranteed that he's one of the few players that will definitely play, but it does just beg the question, what has been the point of grooming Josh as captain of the A team then? Like, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, it's just another thing which probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But I could imagine that if they had announced Josh as vice captain, people probably would have cussed. And said, hold on, how can Josh be vice captain when his place isn't secure and, and, and so on and so forth? Um, ju just moving on to another talking point. Sorry, I should yeah. just highlight this. Thank you to Cameron. You haven't put a question, Cameron. So Cameron has done a super chat here. I'm sure you probably <laughs> meant to put a question, Cameron, but thank you all the same uh, for the support. Much appreciated. Uh, but do put your question in so we can bring it up on the screen. Anybody if, if, anyone else, or, if anyone yeah. else wants to drop a super chat, feel free. You know, me and me and Mash come straight from the, from the bar to this this thing to this live stream. So show yeah. your appreciation if you want to drop a super chat as well. Anyone else? For real, for real, for real. Uh, here's a good point though. Um, somebody's just said it in the chat, and I can't find the exact comment. But a few weeks ago, Santoki, the retainer contracts, the central yeah. contracts were released, and Casey Carty was on that list. If we were looking for a batter, why? I mean, I wouldn't. I, I think I did a video a few days ago where it's like, right, I expect two or one at least of Hope, King, Carty, or Bravo to be in the squad, right? Now, according to Des, Hope said he's not playing. Bravo said he's not playing. Bravo's obviously vexed based on having been left out of the old GI squad, so he's done. No mention was made of King, and more fool me, because I should have asked Des about King. Mm. Like, what, did no one ask Brandon King to play Test cricket? This would have been a chance. But if you've given Casey Carty a central contract, shouldn't he get in straight away? Because what's the point of the central contract then? And in fairness, one of the journalists in the press conference asked that question. They said, so what, why is Carty on contract? If you wanted to take someone to um, Australia, take somebody you've got on central contract. And Des said that, he needs Carty to make more runs in four-day cricket before he brings him into the test squad, which is fair enough. But then where do you stand on that argument, Santoki, about, well, he's got a central contract. Like, it's an experimental squad as it is. Would you not just take Carty into Australia? I don't see what the harm is in not yeah. taking I, I don't get. I don't get what we're losing out by not taking or what we're, what we're gaining by leaving Carty behind. Yeah, that, that's I completely agree. I think if you've contracted him, centrally contracted him, he's obviously we've seen it in white ball cricket. He's obviously someone you're going to persist with, um, for the long term because he's someone who you see as potential. I just don't see what the harm is, especially when we've got there's such a sparse amount of talent. It seems based on this selection, we're just picking anyone. Why you've left out Carty? Surely for the learning experience alone, you'd bring him into this. If you if you see him as sort of a long term player for West Indies across all formats. So that's another that's another baffling one, the fact that he's been told to go and make runs in the regional season. Because then it's a, it's a tricky one then, because Mash, like you said, Justin Greaves, I guess you could say, because he fulfills that all rounder criteria, it's different. But it just seems like if you're taking it on statistics, you're telling some guys to go back and make runs, and then you're picking other men who are averaging 25, 26 in the first last season. So it's like, well, what is the threshold to make the West Indies side at the moment? It just seems a bit random. So Walter Henry says, I can't believe that I agree with Desi on this one. Carty needs to make four-day runs. And I hear you, Walter. I'm not, I'm not saying that Des doesn't have a point. But check this out, Santoki. Carty got called into the ODI team for the series versus England off the back of no runs in Super 50. So this is what I'm saying. There has to, For me, it always comes back to consistency. If Carty was going to get called up to the ODI squad after making no runs in Super 50 and he's got a central contract, you might as well call him to the test squad off the back of no runs at all in, in first-class cricket as well because it's the same thing to me. There has to be a level of consistency. 
How are you calling Carty to the ODI squad with no runs in Super 50 than calling Justin Graves to the Test squad with runs in Super 50? Like, do you, do you see what I'm like? Yeah. Make make the make the dots like yeah. join the dots up. Make it align to to just make general sense because otherwise people just pick holes in things. It, it, it it's too easy to say it don't make sense if 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 you see what I mean. Yeah. There's no. I don't think at this point, Mash, we could, we've tried. We can't rationalise any of the... Oh, thank you. Big up Thomas Miller, man. Big up Tom, man. Long time, long time support of CCP. Drop that yeah, five big up pound. Tom, you big know. up Tom, big up Tom. Big up, man. Respect um, every time. Yeah. And then, um, I, Mash, I just think there's no point trying to rationalise the decision. There's no there's no logic to anything. It's almost as if the selectors are waking up and just thinking, oh, you know what, let's just go with, let's just go with these guys and see what happens. Um, And I also think... As well, I wonder if it was a shock to the selectors or, or cricket West Indies that hope and holder because you know they've been portrayed as sort of stalwarts of like test cricket and the heritage of West Indian cricket. So for both of them to essentially say, Listen, man, like the T20 bags are here, like as you said, hope we don't know, but it looks likely that that is the reason. Um, it must have been a big shock as well because they've invested a lot and it's also kind of backfiring because the players that they've labeled as T20. T20 franchise specialists like Apuran and King, and they've sort of pushed out of selection criteria. They can't even call on them anymore. So we've essentially we're essentially losing more and more players as time goes on. And when when we did the episode about central contracts, Mash, you did say this is just the beginning with Holder and Mayers sort of turning on the contracts. And it does seem to foreshadow this time next year. Who knows who'll be available to play for West Indies in Test cricket? This is the and this is my thing. So this is why I started off by saying when Holder said he'll make himself available for England, if Holder gets called for England, which he probably should, in fairness, but if he does get called, Holder, you're therefore setting a precedent to other players to say, well, boy, you can tell us when you do and don't want to play test matches. Remember, Santoni, we only play six in a year. And man, yeah. <laughs> we only play six. And Manor turning around and going, yeah, I don't want to play that. That's already four <laughs> test matches. So Holder's only got four test matches left for the year. Man's already turned down two of them. So, <laughs> so when you're turning around saying, yeah, I don't want to play that one, you are laying the precedent to say to everybody else that comes up for the system, boy, pick and choose when you want to play. Because yeah. when you want to make the bag, make the bag. And when you want to play for West Indies, play for West Indies. And the guy who was always held up as you are the, the the shining light of what a true West Indian is who doesn't turn down West Indies cricket for the bag. Well, boy, everybody's turning West Indies cricket you know down what? for the bag now. So You know what? You know what? Remember remember wrestling, Ted DiBiossi, man, used to say, everyone's got a price, bro. <laughs> this is what... This is money, money, <laughs> money, 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 money. That's, that's, where, that's where we're at, man. But, but you know um, what? You know what's mad, yeah? I know, I, I, know, I think... The selectors and coaches will justify it by saying, like, batting is different from bowling. But it's mad that we picked the Shamar Joseph, which, as we said, can't knock Shamar Joseph. Obviously, he's done his thing this year. After five first class games, which is exactly the same amount that Nicholas Puran played. But the selectors at the time were horrified at even the thought of Puran getting called up for test cricket. So, again, the double standards are mad at, uh, across all levels. Just just to, to just finish up on that, that point around... Um... The, the T20 players. So um, we've gone past it, but in the comments, people were saying that Hope and Brandon King are playing the Bangladesh Premier League, which is why they're not available for tests. But I just want to remind people, particularly in the case of Brandon King, don't just tell me that such and such has opted to play a particular league, because at the end of the day, if West Indies still select them, they then have to make a choice about whether they want to play that T20 league or whether they want to play for West Indies. So don't, you can't just say to me, oh, Kings play in a league. Did they even pick Brandon King? That's the question that needs to be asked. It's not, is Brandon King playing the league? It's, did they pick Brandon King? And if they picked Brandon King and Brandon King then turned around and said, I don't want to play test cricket, that's a different argument to make altogether. But don't turn around and say, oh, he's playing the league. That That's not how the argument goes. Now, I can see that Matt Pryor is making this point in the chat, uh, Santolki. He's saying it's right that Holder and Hope and King and all them lot go play T20 leagues because there's a World Cup coming up and that's a bigger priority than playing in Australia. So before you answer that for me, Santoki, I just want to say this as well. Is the Australia Test not World Test Championship? What? So are we just saying that that don't matter then? Like, So are we basically saying, I, I need people to answer this for me in the chat. 
are we saying that the World Test Championship has no, there's no meaning to it? We shouldn't try to win any games. We should just get lit down in Australia because it's important for us to go win a few games in our in our own World Cup. So what's the payoff here, people? Are you saying that we have a genuine chance of winning the World Cup in our own territory? Because I'm not. You lot can say that. I'm not saying that because I'm not a dunce, right? So are you lot saying that trying to win a home World Cup, which is unlikely, is more important than trying to win World Test Championship points? We're saying that we can't do both. Come on, man. Come on, man. I think I think if we're saying like if we're saying oh there, there's a World Cup coming up, essentially you're saying then Test cricket don't matter basically. Basically you're saying because there's always going to be some sort of white ball World Cup coming up. Um, I just think the World Cup, especially when so let's take Shai Hope for instance. He's going to be at the World, at the IPL. He's not going to he might not play a lot of games, but he'll be in around the top T20 franchise in the two months building up to the World Cup. I think that's enough preparation. How much preparation do you need? Um considering that there's a World Cup. And also, playing in Bangladesh isn't going to be similar to playing a home World Cup in West Indies. So, I just think, like you said, Mesh, you have to put respect on the World Test Championship. And also, like you said, at the top of the show, it's an away tour to Australia, man. Like, literally, after this, we're probably not going to play an away tour in Australia for at least five, six, maybe seven years. And when you think about the history and heritage and what it means to West Indies cricket, it's ironic that considering this is a tour with so much history and heritage, like I said, two players, Holder and Hope, who had been seen as traders maintaining the heritage of West Indies cricket and the legacy and the test format have basically opted out. So I don't think you can use the World Cup. Obviously, the World Cup is important, but you can't say it's justification to skip an Australia tour, a whole Australia test tour, um, to focus on a World Cup, which is five, six months away. MV with the super chat says, gentlemen, of the 15, who would you not have? Uh, Considering the availability, the selectors have done well here. Uh, MV might be Desi still, but uh, <laughs> good job, Desi. But um, but um, of the fifteen, it's hard. I don't know if you've got the squad in front of you, Santoki. But um, I'm just going to quickly try and do it. Brathwaite yeah. and Shandapur to open. Kurt McKenzie at three. Yeah. Bloody from Af- It might bloody hell. Afanes four. Yeah. Hodge five, fam. We're gonna have a middle order of Mackenzie, Athanas, and Hodge, cuz in Australia. <laughs> These times, <laughs> Mackenzie didn't even get a central contract. These times, we're <laughs> moving uncontracted man at number three, you know. <laughs> so, Mackenzie three, Athanas four. Our number Hodge. three's out here on zero hours contract, you know. I <laughs> don't even get no contract at all. Um, yeah, Athanas at Hodge, four, Hodge, Hodge at five. five. I think, do you know what? I've got a strong feeling it might be, it might all be Sinclair at six, you know, Mm. which sounds ridiculous, but... I don't think we're going to play a specialist spinner. I think the the trend with teams touring Australia is you have an all-rounder who can spin, so I think Sinclair will feel that. I don't think we'll play Moti in Australia. That's all right. So let's just argument say say Sinclair at six, Josh at seven. Then you've got four bowlers from there, right? So it'd be Joseph Roach, the two. The two Josephs, Roach. Do we even have another Seema? What? Jordan. Damn. Akeem Jordan. What? No, wait, what? Unless they go for Moti, but I They're gonna have to I go for Moti, cuz like I just, yeah. Wait, what is this team? Damn, after after Alzari Joseph and Kimar Roach, our options for pace is just Akeem Jordan and Shamar Joseph, two uncapped men. <laughs> like, wait, wait, what's, the, what's going on, guys? Like, the thing is, I think also, to be fair, we're unlucky that Jaden Seals obviously still is yeah, injured true, again. True, true. Um, it's a shame, actually, because he basically would have missed over a year of Test cricket when obviously that's he's someone who's shown promise in that. And also, someone needs to put a search out for Anderson Phillip. I don't know what's happened to Anderson Phillip, you know, because like, this guy. He was playing test this time. I think he played in Australia, didn't he? Or he played last year at test cricket. Yeah, I think he played um, one match. Got did yeah. he break down after one match and then and then we flew out Marquino Mindley oh, and Marquino my. Mindley broke down. Where's Marquino Mindley gone? Mar- <laughs> Marquino Mindley broke down after two overs or something. And we ain't see, and we ain't seen man since. That, that was And the thing is, uh, if you're looking if you're looking at this year, Joseph and Roach are are two are the spearhead of the bowling attack. Roach is 35 and obviously he got injured last year in Australia. It's, it's a tough tour, Australia, being a fast bowler. Is Roach going to play both tests? If he's not, then what are you gonna, what's going to happen? So a lot of questions to be asked. 
I can't. So in conclusion, MB, I'm not even sure what the... Fi- actually, based on that 15-man squad we've got, Justin Graves might actually debut, you know. Yeah, he might debut you- at six. If you think about it, if so it's a 15-man squad, but straight away, you know, Imlak and McCaskey are backup, so they're not going to yeah. be in contention. So you've essentially got that 30-man squad, so there's not that much room to manoeuvre. <laughs> there's only two men who are going to get left out, basically. Uh, let me ask you a serious question, Asantoki. If you were the Australia cricket board and you're sitting now in Australia and you're seeing that squad, I know it's the World Test Championship, and this is going to sound super disrespectful, but I wouldn't play my first team. I would pl- I would pick a couple of first team men who are on the fringes of like selection. So let me think of some Australian man. So like Scott Boland, he's not fringes. What I mean is like I'm not playing Pat Cummins. I'm not playing. I know Cum- okay, Cummins has to play as a captain, but I'm not playing Mitchell Stark. I'm not telling. I'm not. I'm telling Josh Hazel- Hazelwood. You know what? You just take a rest. Because we don't need you to lick down these men. Like I'm, I'll, I'll play a Nathan Lyon. I'll play a Pat Cummins because he's captain. But I'm, I'm looking at a few next men because, with respect, Santoki, when you really look at our squad, a lot of them are the guys who just went to South Africa to play South Africa A, mm. and and yeah. and they lost two one against South Africa A. Right. So put it this way: if I'm Australia. And I'm not saying this to this West Indies. I just think this is facts. If I'm Australia, I'm not playing West Indies again for 15 years after this. I'm just, I'm just refusing to yeah. play them. I'm saying if that's the type of team you're going to come on a tour with to Australia, we're never pl- they're going to treat us like Zimbabwe. We're never playing them again, cuz. That's it. They'll never want us to come to Australia again. Yeah, because so for context, so people might be wondering why are we playing them two consecutive years? Obviously... The quirk of the World Test Championship meant that we played them last year and then we just happened to get drawn as the first match that they play, one of the first matches they play in the new cycle. But the TV broadcasters, I don't know who it was, I don't know if it's Fox or like Channel 7 in Australia, basically tried to change it because they weren't happy because last year there was little interest in the West Indies series because of the quality of West Indies. So you can imagine this year, Mash, <laughs> how it's going to go down. And I remember reading a few articles from Australian journalists last year essentially saying, after this tour, West Indies probably won't tour again for another seven, eight years minimum because there's no benefit, there's no publicity. And so unless Cricket Australia are obligated by a World Test Championship to play West Indies, they're not really going to want to choose to do it. And this will just further stoke their fire because if you're marketing this, Mash, if you're a market, I right, say you're a marketing executive, if you're putting a poster up of, of a face of a player, like if you had to pick two West Indian players on this test side to market, who are you going to pick? <laughs> Um, You'd have Craig Brathwaite as one, but who else are you picking? <laughs> Shamar Joseph. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> like, there's no, there's no, there's no, like, the, what are you marketing on? It's, just, it's, it's a half the squad, seven of the 15 are uncapped guys. This is basically like a, like I said, it's basically like a COVID emergency squad. The thing is, we're not even having a laugh at this. It's just right. It's just facts. It's just facts. Do you remember last year's tour? They had Brian Lara as the West Indies expert, right? On the sh- on uh, on the tour, and Lara didn't even know who our players were. So what's Lara gonna do this time round? He didn't even know. He didn't even know the man who went last year, and that was our that was a, that was like our first team that went. You think Brian Lara's ever seen Shamar Joseph bowl a ball in his life? Impossible, <laughs> impossible. Who's gonna be the West Indian on comms for this tour? Who actually has seen any of these players play? It can't be Lara. It can't be laughing. Oh, actually, you know what? Not even you know what? Not even not even trying to trying to come across as, as egotistical. But we we've been watching these guys. We've actually watched Shamar Joseph and all these guys. So when people are like, "Yeah, you man should give it a shot of selectors," like obviously it's not up to us. But Mash, we would have the credentials because we've actually been following these players pretty much. Like Shamar Joseph, we've been saying since the beginning of the year what he's been doing. We we've, we've watched the A team tour. We watched everything. So, but like you said, around. It seems like with the selectors and even those within the hierarchy aren't watching, wouldn't have watched a lot of these players. It's an unknown quantity. But as when you factor in Australia as well, the big bash is going on at the same time. There are basically going to be about seven or eight men watching this West Indies series. <laughs> yeah, then and we can't rely on the Australian commentators. I can't remember what this called in Australia. Is it Channel Two or whatever? We yeah. can't rely on them to do any research. Last time, last this time last year, 
the Australian commentators were dunce and bolsey. They, like, they didn't even bother to do even the most basic of research to find out who our players were, what their backgrounds were, what have they done in their careers. They, they, they commentated as if they just turned up on the day and were told, oh, Australia are playing West Indies. Let's have, many, let's have a joke and a laugh about West Indies. So, you know. How many times do you think they'll mention that Shamar Joseph was a security guard? I think that will, be the, that will basically be the story that they have to go with. There's no the other story. Yeah. It's, it's that. It's that. It's they either go with that narrative or they go with the fact that Tej is, is Shiv's son. That's the only narratives they can go basically. with. Um, before we wrap this up, Santoki, there's another super chat, but there's just this question as well that I want to address. Yeah. So Aaron said, Mash or Santoki, is there any word on Bell Drummond? So I did ask um, Des about this. I've been meaning to ask Des about this in press conferences for a while. So I said to Des, have you made any play to reach out to the diaspora or diaspora um, because there must be players who may or may not want to play for us. And Des's response, just read my notes, Des said that his fellow selector, I'm assuming he's, relating, he's referring to Roland Butcher, had reached out to, he didn't name any names, but he said he's reached out to players in England, New Zealand and Australia who all qualify to play for the West Indies. But he said that people have to understand that those players um, have their own, I can't remember how Des phrased it, it was something like, They've got their own decisions to make as to whether playing for the West Indies is the right thing for them and that we can't force these players to play for the West Indies. But the point was that Des, Des was intimating that conversations had been had with, with players in, in the diaspora. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting. <clears throat> I'm, I know there was... We did get people tweeting us about a guy in Australia whose mother was from Trinidad, but I forgot his name, to be fair, but he was someone who was talked of highly. I can't think of who it would be in New Zealand, but obviously you'd imagine Daniel Beljama was in that conversation in terms of someone being from England. So mm. uh, let's see how it goes. But Mash, if you're, to be honest, if you're Daniel Beljama and you're looking at this squad, you're thinking, at this point, do I commit to West Indies? Yeah, Oliver think... Davies is what Joel Bob has put in the chat, was the name of that player um, in be, Australia. Yeah. Um, so MV with the last super chat of the evening, and thank you again, MV, much appreciated. Says this is oh this was so Brathwaite, Shannon, Paul McKenzie, Athenes, De Silva, Alzari, Roach will start. Yeah, I agree with that. Graves and Multi, three, four, five, six, seven. But that's only nine players. MV Graves and Multi, and he says Multi is a budding superstar. So I get yeah, fine. Um, MV, I agree with all of those players starting. Probably Graves, I agree. But that's only nine, so you didn't give us your, your final two. But thank you for that. So listen, Santoki, mm. we said to try and keep this one to 30 minutes. It's, got, it's just going to go shy of 50. Um, 300, there was over 300 people in the chat for this one. We didn't even, we only advertised this with 10 minutes Literally to go before we went minute. live. So big up everybody who came in on the live for this one. Um, on your way out, when you do go, if you haven't already done so, do press like, do share, do share the live um, and subscribe to the channel. Of course, we haven't even spoken about the fact that the T20 decider is 2-2 in the series versus England. Um, the decider is tomorrow in Taruba. Um, who will win that particular series? It's worth noting, though, Santoki, as much as West Indies have been down bad um, in the last two games, didn't we Didn't we go 2-0 up against India and then win yeah. the final one as well? And Mm. Obviously, we came. I think we came from behind to beat South Africa. Maybe. South Africa was the, no. South Africa was the same. We were one up, then one one, then we won the final one. So right. we seem to have a habit of winning clutch when it matters. So all to play for tomorrow. Obviously, Mash, you'll be commentating on on Talksport in the UK. So anyone in the UK, check out Talksport. I think on their YouTube, they're doing live watch alongs or on Talksport Radio. You'll hear Mash commentating, and hopefully, Mash, you're, you're on a losing streak at the moment. Two games commentated, two losses. So hopefully. Your fortunes change, but yeah, we'll be doing a review show of that. Looking um towards the towards where 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 our T Twenty squad stands ahead of the World Cup six months away. So keep an eye out for that drop in. And um yeah, but other than that, Mash, I, I don't know where. And it was Oliver Davis for those in the chat. Oliver Davis is the guy from Australia, has a mother from Trinidad, so he would qualify. But yeah, Mash. Other than that, I would. I'm not even going to say what our future episodes could be like because. We've said it all the time, and it's always proven true. Never a dull day in West Indies cricket. Could be another emergency pod this weekend, for all we know. So keep an eye out on our channel. And But regardless, we'll have content coming soon. So with that note, Mash, I think it's time for us to get back to the bar. To take a few yeah. more shots. <laughs> for real, for real, for real, people. Let me go back and lick down a few more rum and cokes. And uh, I'll see you lot all tomorrow for the final decider. Thank you for joining the live. 
Make sure you press like on the way out. Make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you again soon. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.